Hi, this is Devin Olavsky, and welcome to the Rabbi Olavsky Show. <laughs> like that. Anyway, <laughs> well, once again, we're happy to have you with us, whether you're watching with our friends over at Tour Anytime, or wherever you watch and listen to your podcast, we're happy to have you along. It was interesting. You know, I got an email from somebody and said, you're on a lot of different platforms, you know, uh, you're on Torrent Time, you're on YouTube, you're on Spotify, uh, you're on uh, Platform 9 and 3 quarters. Whatever the case happens to be, you're on a lot of different platforms. Which one should I watch? So you'll notice that whenever I say this, I, uh, I, I always say um, uh, our friends over at Torrent Time or wherever you watch your podcast. So why am I stressing Torrent Time? So uh, we had the schus of having our friends from Torrent Time on our live uh, podcast, and they pointed out something once that I thought was cogent. And they said, when you go to Torrent Time and you look for a Torah shir, you know you're not going to see any bad content. When you go on to YouTube, so then uh, they'll suggest other videos, and uh, some of them may not be appropriate. So do you really want to expose people to that? So uh, so obviously, if you're on YouTube all day anyway, you know what I mean? So like, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be the one that's going to mess you up, you know? Obviously, when you have subscribers on YouTube, then you can monetize it. I'm up to now 1,400 subscribers on YouTube, which means that if I was to allow advertisements, I would get a penny for every other podcast. <laughs> now, that's not real serious money. <laughs> so, uh, so therefore, that is why I always mention uh, our friends over at Tony Time or wherever else you watch it, because I'm not here. This is a value-free zone. I think we've more or less established that. I'm here to give you my thoughts and opinions, and I'm not here to tell anybody else what to do. Everybody has to make their own decisions in life. If I can make your life a little bit uh, better, there are people who watch this show who are Tamadei Chachamim. There are people who are Bnei Yeshiva. I just got an email from someone who uh, drives a bus. So we have a uh, Balabas who listens. <laughs> in any event, all different types of people listen and, and from all different walks and wherever you That's why we're on multiple platforms to be able to provide uh, wherever um, we can get that access in. And remember, every now and then I get an email from someone who says, I just found this podcast. And we're around over three years. How'd you just find it now? So uh, it's because uh, my loyal uh, listeners, you have to go out and spread the word, let everybody know about this, you know? Gosh, why uh, Why would you keep it just for yourself? It's not like it's going to get used up. It's it's recorded. This is digital. Yeah, there's plenty for everybody. So uh, we, hope to, uh, we hope to expand our audience. And as I mentioned, uh, I have a trip coming up around Lag Boma time. I hope to do a uh, few of these Rabbi Olowski lives, because what could be better than having a whole bunch of Rabbi Olowski show crazies all together in one room? The energy is dramatic. And if, if anything good is going to happen in the world, it's going to come from that group of people, because, you know, you're the best. Okay. And uh, sponsorship this week. Sponsored anonymously as a schus for all children and adults. Battling the Sionis. Oh, what a tough, tough door. We, the Sionis that we have to face. The world in absolute terms is not worse, but, but we are. <laughs> Every, uh, what, what the old generation used to have to face uh, boggles the mind. Boggles the mind. I have, I've done this many times. I've played this over in my head. If I was in the Holocaust... I'm pretty sure I wouldn't make it to the train. They would probably shoot me before I got to the train. Uh, this is not for me. I can't handle this kind of stuff. And you saw there were people there. They had typhoid. They were starving. They got up every morning, you know, after a few hours of sleep with the freezing cold going out and breaking rocks. Where'd they get this kayak from? And us, you know, if we have to put the milk back in the refrigerator, you know, we, we're like... Did you see what I did? Did you see? Do you see I put the milk back? <laughs> Does he remember to put the milk back? You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Big success. 
Oi, and they should be zeichet to siyat to shmaya and to do tshuva on all these shortcomings. Halavai, halavai. We should all be zeichet to that. Okay, um, Pesach's coming up. We're we're within the month of Nisan already. Uh, by the Hasidim, they say Chodesh Nisim because uh, it's uh, it's it's obviously a month of. Tremendous. Things are not by accident. The, the, even though the names of the months that we have were taken from Babylonian gods, right? Um, which is sometimes where the months come from. Uh, and the secular calendar, January, was named after the god Janus, who is the two faced god who watched the old year going and the new year coming. Um, March was named after Mars, the god of war, because people used to go into into winter quarters during the winter, and then they would come out in March and they would uh, start again. And it's very interesting. I read a biography of General Zhukov, who was the one of the major players in the Russian army during World War II, and he kept saying they were anticipating the next um, German spring offensive. I would wait for the spring, and then they would start another offensive. And uh, and that's why in uh, 1943, he expected it to be in Kurtzk. He was right. He surrounded the town and uh, protected it and was able to stop uh, the German advance. But uh, that's when you go. That's why it was named after Mars. Mai is a Maya, the goddess of uh, springtime. So well, it's very often. So all the names that we have of months were uh, Babylonian gods. By the way, I remember hearing someone ask Rib David Cohen once, what's the significance of the fact that we took the names of Avodah Zorah for our months? He says, because when you realize that these gods have no power, every time you mention them, uh, it's, 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 it's machin chayzik. Like the Rambam says, Tammuz. Tammuz was, uh, was a uh, powerful uh, Avodah Zorah. But when you see that it has no value, it's making fun of it, you know. When Thor, the god of thunder, joins the Avengers, you understand it, it takes away. It takes away. When Hercules becomes a Disney movie, it takes away. There's no chashivas there anymore. You know what I mean? You know, whereas to this point, nobody has like, made a film, you know, the, you know, ex- you know, the fun, and, fun and exciting adventures of Yashka. You know what I mean? And like, you know, have him solving crimes or something like that. <laughs> like, you're not going to do that because people still take him seriously, yeah? But when you... Use the Vodazara, Machaizik, you know, great Zeus. <laughs> Some guy on top of a mountain with a lightning bolt. I mean, come on, no one's going to take this seriously, you know? So um, uh, through that, you take you take the power that exists and you, you Machaizik of it, yeah? So that's why we Dafka named our, our months after that. And so all of these things were names of God, so the, the Hebrew ones that we have. So um, uh, nonetheless, Right, even though Yisrael Kedoshim Hem, there's nothing that we do that's nothing. Every word has special significance. So the fact that British could be read as Brit Ish, the people of the Covenant or the Commonwealth, yeah, um, is not insignificant. The fact that Russia is called Russia, I think, says something. Right, Poland. Right? They said Poland, he will stay. Jews lived in Poland for a thousand years. You know, uh, the Jews lived in Spain for many years. It was called Safar because they kept saying so far, so good until they realized they, I don't know if that one's true. I just made that one up. But, um, uh, but America, I mean, it's America, it's an empty nation. You know what I mean? Um, uh, people don't get very excited. Uh, Unless somebody slaps someone at the Oscars, and then suddenly this is major news. You understand? This is this is every this is all they can talk about. <laughs> There's a war raging in Ukraine. People are being blown up. Uh, houses are being destroyed. But this guy slaps somebody at the oh my gosh! What a, what are we as a society? Where have we come? <laughs> I'm a Reka. You know, I I took. Uh, Sixteen-year-old son and my twenty-one-year-old daughter with my wife and I for a trip to America. Okay, now, if you're an Israeli and you go to America, right? Okay, so we we, we were mostly based in New York. Did we go to the Empire State Building? No. We go to the Statue of Liberty? No. 
Uh, uh, did we uh, take uh, the circle line? No. Uh, well, you don't do anything. What do you do? You shop and you eat. That's what you do in America. That's what America is for. You know, my son had a certain list of goals. One of them was Izzy's Smokehouse, which is in Crown Heights. Uh, uh, to me, and don't take this the wrong way, but I'm a nice Long Island kid. To me, all of Brooklyn is a slum. <laughs> It's all those, it's all those riot doors and, and graffiti everywhere, and you know, it's a, it's, it's a rough drive, you know, and all the roads are broken. <laughs> it's like there's no parking, you know. Most people in Brooklyn are still circling around looking for a parking spot. You know, they usually just park in Queens and take the bus, you know. But um, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, that was that's the, what do you go to America for? It's I'm a raker, you know. It's 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 uh, the. There's just the gashmius of it without any, without any real serious uh, basis to it. Okay, so where's the significance of the fact that Nissan, uh, Tishrei, right? Tishrei, all the money you're going to get in the year is decided between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. It's a, that's a Gemara in Rosh Hashanah. To Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, it's decided how much money you're going to have for the year, except for Tishrei. It's Talmud Torah, Shabbos, Rosh is Rosh Chodesh, Yud is Yantif. Those things are not included. That's what you always hear. What you spend on Shabbos, that doesn't come out of your money. That's uh, Kush Baruch's money. Uh, that doesn't mean, obviously, you can cheat the system and say, you know, okay, well, I'll, you know, I'll make uh, food for 100 people, you know, for Shabbos, and you know, I'll eat the leftovers during the week. You know, that's a trick. So, uh, yeah, you, have, you know, you have to be Mechabe Shabbos, the mitzvah to be Mechabe Shabbos uh, as much as you can. You don't have to worry. It's not on your cheshman. Okay. So Nisan is called Nisim, the, the, like I say, because the names are significant. Names are always significant. I remember when George W. Bush was running against John Kerry and the signs up here in Israel, you know, Bush and Kerry, you know, different supporters. And I said, this is a contest between embarrassment and tumma. And that's that's who we're voting for. Do you want to vote for the Tuma or for the Busha? <laughs> and the fact that Obama is the name of Obama, which is a, you know, uh, all to make the sacrifice, does it mean anything? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it does. Anyway, be that as it may. Um, so uh, so let's get back. So it's almost Pesach. I want to share an idea that has personal significance because, uh, as people always point out, you know, uh, one of the things about this podcast, whether you like it or not, is that I tend to share a lot of personal thoughts and uh, try to put that into a context. Luckily, um, there are enough people who find them interesting as well. Yeah, so that's why I share them. Um, I heard Pesach Kron say something uh, in a share many, many, many years ago. It made a deep impression on me. Pesach Kron is one of my heroes, one of the one of the greats of our generation. People don't appreciate it, you know, because uh, that's not how we usually, uh, you know, we 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 obviously put Gedolei Torah up. But there are heroes of of all stripes, and um, uh, Pesach Kron, the amount of Chesed and and things that he does to inspire Klai Yisrael is just unbelievable. Anyway, so he. He's, his father died young. His father died young, and everything fell on Pesach to have to try to take care of the family and, and everything like that, which he did beautifully and with, you know, tremendous enthusiasm. He tells a story where at some point he realized he had passed the age of his father when he passed away. Right? Whatever age his father passed away, it was older than this. I, I understand that. Right? Now the Gemara says you should get nervous five years before the death of your parent. And that's why Yitzchak got nervous um, when he was in the five years of Sarah. He didn't know if he was going to die by Sarah or by, or by Avraham. And uh, so that's why he wanted to make sure and gave out the brachas. So, um, uh, so I had a brother who passed away at my age. So... You know, in the family, people keep tabs. You know, have you have you passed that milestone? You know, and uh, these things these things uh, are very meaningful. 
Anyway, so he realized he was at the Seder, and he realized I've, I'm, I'm older than my father was at this age. And he made the bracha at the beginning of the Seder that you make in Kadesh. Shehechiyanu v'kimanu v'higiyanu lazman hazeh. And he started to cry. God gave us life and kept us around to be able to spend this Pesach together. I've mentioned this in the past, but that that didn't make such an impression on me at the time. But after my heart attack and my bypass operation, when two major doctors told me I really shouldn't have made it. And I remind my wife of this because she doesn't understand how I usually have such a positive attitude when I am by nature such a negative person. Yeah. Uh, someone once said, some people look at the glass and say it's half empty. Some look at the glass and say it's half full. You say it's probably poisoned. You know, okay. So I tend to be a little negative. I, I agree. I agree. I tend to be negative. Um, I used to say when I was younger, I said, I'd rather be a pessimist than an optimist. Because if you're a pessimist and things go wrong, you anticipated it. If you're an optimist, you don't have to deal with it. So the guy says to me, you don't understand shot. If you're an optimist, nothing ever goes wrong. And if you're a pessimist, nothing ever goes right. <laughs> And that, that's, a, that's, that's clever. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> but, uh, but I think about this, and because of that story that Pesach told on Pesach, particularly when I make that bracha shechianu, and I look around, and I'm surrounded by my children, my grandchildren. So uh, three years ago, um, I got uh, six offers for Pesach Hotels. And um, I tell you the truth, I like to be home. I like Pesach in my house. I like the food that we cook. I like our kalim. I like, all right. Now, I did one thing that was a uh, major change in my life that changed everything. I, I used to try to clean my self-cleaning oven. <laughs> now, in theory, you turn on the self-cleaning oven and it's all clean. But it's really not. So they say, well, you know, it doesn't really get the door and it doesn't really get this. And if you wrap it around with aluminum foil, I'm not going to wrap it around with aluminum foil. Yeah. So uh, somebody uh, somebody said to me, you know, why do you cash your, your counters um, and then cover them? I said, because I'm worried I didn't cash them well. He says, well, then just cover them. So I'm worried I didn't cover them well. <laughs> I think it's between the two. So I'm going to take it up and I'm going to cook my food. You know what I mean? Wrap it around a little bit for I hope that I did it on right. My wife wraps up the leftovers. It's like hermetically sealed. She gets the aluminum for catches all the way around. You know what I mean? You know, if you go in the middle of the night, you know, and you want to take a little something, she'll know instantly because there's no way I can replicate the way that she closes that up. You know? Tupperware has nothing on my wife with a piece of aluminum foil, you know? So, uh, so I'm going to do the door that way. That's why the kids never, never want me to cover their books. <laughs> you don't have to cover your books for school, you know. So I would take whatever the wrapping paper was, you know, and if you use enough scotch tape, you'll get it on. It'll stay. <laughs> my mother, my wife, she would like fold it over and this and cut it like this. And I would put it on, it would slip on. It was, ah, oh, a work of art. You understand? I don't, uh, that's, I'm an idea guy. <laughs> In fact, I got an email from somebody. He says, why do they kasha and cover their counters? No, kasha from a misa. <laughs> anyway, but, uh, uh, you know, so I'm going to go and, all right. So I hired two yeshiva <laughs> to clean my oven. And when they were done, I had to clean my oven again. So I realized the money I paid them was a waste of time because nobody cleans it like I do, you know? So, uh, and I just couldn't do it. I just think it was scraper scraping over all these black dots and stuff. And then, you know. So I made a cheshman when I paid these guys that amount of money in 10 years, I could buy myself a new oven. And by the way, when I say new oven, I have, I live here in Israel. Well, I have an American oven, a GE. Yeah. An oven. These Israelis, they all buy these little like European ovens that like Betty Crocker, you know, you take the little pan, you can say like a nine by 13, one pan and put it in. What am I going to do with that? Make one kugel. It's Pesach. I'm family here. <laughs> I put in like three big pans of chicken, you know, get everything cooking over there. And even then, you don't have enough. 
So I bought myself a uh, another American oven. Now, where am I going to keep it? I keep it in the bag of the machsan, which means that after we finish all the cleaning, I have to empty the entire machsan, and there's a lot of stuff there. Wheel out the oven, which is pretty heavy because we keep a bunch of Pesach stuff in there, and you'd think that I would, like, open the oven and take the stuff out for us, but, you know, that's just not the way I swing, you know? So, um, you know, drag this thing all the way into the house, and then you have to put everything back into the machsan. And then after Pesach, you have to take everything out of the machsan, put the oven back, and put everything back in. It, 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 was, it was difficult. It was nice to have a new oven. So when we redid the kitchen, I said, I want one cabinet that I'm going to be able to keep my Pesach oven in. So we extended the kitchen, and they made this one gigantic cabinet, and I put the oven in there, and there's enough room, it's a big cabinet for all my Pesach Caleb. Because you know, when you clean the house for Pesach, and you empty out this cabinet, and you put this away, you never find them again, ever, not until next year, you know, you never find the Shabbos, and you have to go buy a new one, the hot plate, uh, you know, you don't know where these Caleb, everything's just disappear. You know? So, um, um, so like this, I don't have a problem, we could tape everything up, you know, Kasha the counter with boiling hot water and a hot rock, which for me, this is not a good combination. <laughs> Kasha the counter, when you cover it, and then you open it up and just wheel out your, your oven, take the other one out to the mirror, pass it, plug it in. Life changing event. So I like being home for Pesach. Be surrounded by children and grandchildren. What a, what a schus. And going to a hotel in and of itself is not enough of an attraction for me. If I could give a Pesach to my children, then it's worthwhile. But uh, just for the schus to be in a hotel for myself, I like being home. Yeah. I like my bed, I like my room, I like my stuff. Anyway, so, uh, um, so I got three offers. So I said, okay, if I could bring my family. They said, sure. What's involved? And back then... We weren't such a big family, you know. Nine rooms and 22 tickets. So two programs said, are you out of your mind? I said, you asked me. What do you want from me? I told you I want to be with my family. I said, don't take me, you know. Two of them said, I wish we could. You're really worth it, but I don't think it's in our budget. Two people said, we can make it work. And I never heard from them again. <laughs> but, uh, so I'm sitting at the Seder with my children, my grandchildren, and uh, and I make that bracha. And I think to myself, I'm still alive. And when things go bad, and my wife says to me, how could you be so positive? And I said, I'm supposed to be dead. Do you know, whatever you're going through now is difficult, but it would probably be worse if I was dead. Right? Because I may not help that much, but whatever I do, you wouldn't have that either. You know? So I help a little bit. I told my kids, when I die, people won't even know for a while. I'll just get a cardboard cut out of me and put it in front of the computer. People won't know for years that I'm actually gone. But, you know, just keep doing old podcasts. <laughs> so, uh, but, um, uh, you know, I said, I'm still alive. And here I am sitting at the Seder. Surrounded with my children and my grandchildren. You wake up in the morning. I'm still alive. By the way, those of you who are joining the Tefillah series after Pesach, okay, well, we're going to talk about this idea also. But because I'm not even going to, I'm trying to, I've been playing this out in my mind now for months, you know. I'm going to try to stay away from general philosophy and introduction to tefillah and stuff like that. I want to go into beer tefillah. I want to go into the actual beer and uh, whether that's Budweiser, whether, whatever it's involved. You know what I'm I'm going to go into every beer tefillah we can find. <laughs> but uh, the idea is uh, no corona. Anyway, uh, but the idea is, you know, you start off, you wake up in the morning, you say, wow, I'm alive. Because if you wake in the morning and you're dead, it changes the whole day. Trust me. It's a whole different day. You're like, oh, man, I'm dead? <laughs> I've said that at times. I wake up in the morning and I say, oh, I'm dead. But I'm not really dead. But imagine you're really dead and you're like, oh, what do I do now? Well, I guess I'll just lay here until they decide what to do with me. 
<laughs> so uh, who knows? I know somebody in America. He says, I want to be buried near Israel, but you know, it costs a lot of money to send it over. So I told him, when I start to die, just sit me up in a wheelchair until rigor mortis sits in, and then just buy me a regular seat, you know? Just bring me in. Uh, does your friend want uh, um, want a meal? Oh, no, he's dead. Just let him stay where he is. <laughs> just spray him once in a while, you know? But um, but to be able to uh, still be here, you wake up in the morning, you say, I'm alive. What else do I have to ask for? What else could you ask for in life than to be alive? And what would we do to stay alive? So I hear him at the Seder. And we have wine and we have matzah and we have our Pesach dishes. When we first got married, we found these dishes on sale. And we said, they look like Pesach dishes. Then we looked and we saw they were made in Poland because that's where all the Pesach dishes come from, from your grandmother, from Poland. Yeah. She, she brought them over and gave them to you, you know. So they were perfect, perfect Pesach dishes, you know. <laughs> we put out the Pesach dishes. We set everything up. Last year, one of my grandchildren was sitting next to me. He was four or five years old. And he was literally hopping up and down. He was so excited for the Seder, you know. And, and, and uh, the, everything that goes into, oh, I'm like that too. And I, and I think about those words, I was zoiche to make it to another Pesach. I have to tell you, when you almost die, you, uh, you don't take these things for granted. You know? Someone said, uh, I understand you're happy with your life, but like, what was, what was the deepest thing for you? So the deepest thing is that I was able to spare my family that experience where at every Simcha they go, and I know that Ab is with us, Ab uh, Shemayim, I'm sure he would have liked to have been here. You know? Now no one says that, because I'm there. <laughs> they say, Abba obviously doesn't want to be here. <laughs> He'd rather be home. <laughs> yeah. You know. I'm not quite the party person, but but to be able to be surrounded with your children and grandchildren and to say, what an unbelievable thing. And every day is a gift. That's why we call it the present. Okay? That's what we have. And uh, we we have this tremendous gift. Every day we wake up in the morning and we say, I'm still here. Another day filled with opportunity. Usually wasted, but anything that we do, the entire world was created for the sake of one mitzvah, and that was the mitzvah's low sassing. So, you know, you get up in the morning, and someone gets you really upset during the course of the day, and you don't kill him. Well, that's a, you were Mekayim of mitzvah's low sassing, of low sirtzach. You didn't kill him. Yeah, so, uh, pity stayed his hand. It's a pity I ran out of bullets. <laughs> but you're saying, I'm not going to, we focus on all the times we speak Lashon Hara, but imagine every time you wanted to speak Lashon Hara and you didn't. You know these people, sometimes they have a Shmirah for like two hours. They're like, oh, I got a great story to tell you. I'll call you in a half an hour. <laughs> but say it, but that's chos, that's chos, that Loz Ase was enough for the entire world to be created. And in Mitzvah's Ase is metaking the world. You get to fix it with it. Every time you make a bracha in the course of a day, and we know everything good that you do, Rashi tells us, is 500 times better, stronger than every bad thing. Because by a bad thing, it says, you'll get punished till four generations. And by a good thing, I'll pay him 2,000 generations. So the good that we do is so much more powerful than the bad that we do. So uh, every day is an opportunity for us to do things. You come to a Seder, why is this night different, says the Svan Samus? Because this is a night that's a day. First bracha you make is, Why? Because all these are brachas about mitzvahs. There are a lot more mitzvahs during the day than there are at night. And this is a night that's filled with mitzvahs. If you ever make a count, how many mitzvahs there are in Pesach night, it's incredible. This is a night that's a day. Why is this night different than all the nights? Yeah. In fact, I, I spoke once at a uh, dinner for a fellow who was a knight of the realm in England. Um, 
It used to be that you had to, you know, put on the armor and get a horse and a lance and, you know. Now, if you do anything that is considered significant business accomplishments, art, you know, Elton John is a knight, you know. Paul McCartney is a knight. Yeah. So I was speaking at this dinner for this, you know, wealthy Jewish guy. And uh, usually a knight has to be, be Christian, obviously. So here you have a Jewish knight. So one of the people said, I have an opening for you. <laughs> I'm always a little wary when people write material for me, but okay, sometimes. You know. She says, I think you should start off by saying, why is this knight different than all other knights? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't go with that one. But anyway, oh, it was great. It was a cross-section of like aristocratic English society. It was a guy there named the Colonel. He had a walrus mustache and a monocle. I'm telling you, he was right out of clue. I couldn't believe it, you know? And I was like, all, all these, you know? So they kept giving me drinks. And I, I don't drink. I have a very low tolerance to alcohol, you know? So I had a couple of drinks. And then I get up to speak and everybody lights up cigars. The room starts spinning around. I was holding on to the shtenda. And I, I, I could barely get out my words. I was like so dizzy. And they said, that was the most enthusiastic speech we've ever heard. Excellent job, Rabbi. Excellent job. <laughs> I was like, gosh, good thing I didn't do my regular level of enthusiasm. They would have all died of heart attacks. You know what I mean? That much excitement in one room. Anyway. So, uh, what can I tell you? It's... Uh, Rich people are fun. So uh, this, this, this guy wanted to come and speak to me. I asked me if I'd come and meet him in his office. He was going to send his Rolls Royce for me. He's like a fabulously wealthy fellow, you know. I go down to his office and uh, we're talking about his life. And, and he's, he's making a lot of poor decisions. I don't want to go into all the details. Cause I don't want to get knocked off of Nucky Radio again. But but uh, he was making a lot of poor decisions in life, you know. And I, he said, give me a Musa. I said, you know, you're going to lose your wife. You're going to lose your family. You're going to lose everything. Is this what you want? He goes, no. I said, don't tell me no. What are you going to do? You're a businessman. Action plan. Let's talk. What are we going to do? And he says, you know, no rabbi speaks to me like this. <laughs> I said, they all want your money. I don't need your money. Yeah? I'm heir to the Orlovsky fortune. <laughs> Wherever that might be, uh, it's hidden in a cave somewhere. <laughs> I'm going to go adventuring, looking for it one day, you know. Ah, oh, the famed Orlovsky fortune. <laughs> it must have built up over the years. I come from a long line of cattle thieves. But anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> So, uh, be that as it may, I'm, I'm digressing. The point is, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, that Shech Yonavikimon Vikonazan is that. That's the, the idea I wanted to develop. Uh, and, uh, and just think about that. Think about that every day, but certainly when you make that Baruch Shech Yonav, think about the fact that Akash Baruch Hu has given me the gift to be alive. We take it for granted. It was just a terrorist attack on B'nai Brak, a young father. Yeah, young father was was shot by a terrorist. He's he's the kadosh. He goes straight to Shemaim. You know, I was commenting to my family afterwards. I said, you know, wow, that's that's how I, if if when my when my time comes, that's how I want to go. And they're like, oh, you're being morbid. I said, no, I'm not. If Henoch Leibowitz tells the story that he was with his father of David Leibowitz in Europe, and these anti semites started shooting at them, and uh, they missed. And his father said, I almost thought I was Zaycha to die as Kiddush Hashem. And uh, he says, he says, I was a little boy, I started to cry. I said, Tati, you want to die? He says, no. But if you knew what it meant to die as Kiddush Hashem, you'd understand what an opportunity it is. There's no Gehenim, there's no Din, you go straight up to Shemayim, the highest levels of Olam Haba. Between me and you, that's the only way I'm getting there. So, I tend to walk through bad neighborhoods and say, Ich bin a yid, ich bin a, you know, and so far I have no takers, you know. You gotta be, you gotta, you gotta be on the level to, 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 to be chosen for something like that. But if you're still here, Sheikh Yano Vikimano Vikimano Hashem kept me here. I'm still here. Okay, now we come to the question and answer 
portion of our program. There's just too many P's in that sentence. <laughs> um, please come to the pretty portion of the program. <laughs> it's a pertinent question. <laughs> Personnel. Anyway. So, Anonymous asks, do you think a good mother should enjoy sitting on the floor and playing dolls with her daughter? Am I doing something wrong if I try to get out of that activity? <laughs> All right. Not every activity that every child does is going to appeal to every parent, right? Um, I.e., I was uh, not a sportsman. I was not and am not. When I was in camp, um, something I never enjoyed. Camp was not made for somebody like me. I was a sensitive uh, young man, liked to read and, uh, and think. And, uh, and I didn't want to play baseball four periods a day, you know. And I wasn't particularly good at it. So they invented a new position for me called the deep center field. By the time I walked out there, the inning was over. I started to walk back, you know. I used to take a book with me in case it was a long inning, and I would read a little bit. And they would contact me through semaphore flags, and I'd slowly make my way back. By the time I got back, it's time to go back, you know. They would often have someone pinch hit for me, you know. One time, the ball actually came there. I heard the shouting in the distance. I looked around, and there was the ball. I'd never actually seen it. And I picked it up, and I threw it with all my strength, and I walked a few steps, and I picked it up, and I threw it again. And I, anyway, eventually the, the inning was over. But So sports is not for me. So my sons, I have mostly daughters, um, but my sons wanted to play sports with me. I don't play sports. What am I supposed to do? You know, go out and play soccer? Soccer doesn't I mean, bounce a ball off my head. I, mean, I, just, I would never do that on purpose. You know what I mean? Football? Giant refrigerator freezers smashing into each other. Not for me, you know. A bunch of French Canadians wearing sharp, you know, blades on their feet, carrying sticks and hitting each other. Does that sound like I would want to do that? I don't think so, you know. So uh, uh, sports were just not my thing. So, okay, so my kids wanted to play sports. So uh, I'd get other people to play with them. <laughs> Basketball, I mean, I just, uh, it's so boring. Anyway, so... Um, uh, so these things held no appeal for me, you know. And kids wanted to play sports. Uh, I'm not prepared to do it. I mean, when I said prepared to do it, I mean, you know, if, if I had to, I would. But I don't get excited about it. And so if I could get out of it, I would definitely get out of it. Yeah. Not every activity is going to be exciting. Now, I am an exciting enough person that I can find other exciting things to do with my children. So... If playing with dolls per se is not what you enjoy doing, okay. Not everyone masters chamesh avanim. For those of you who are not from Israel, yeah, call it jacks. I don't know. I never played jacks, but uh, you know you have to like bounce a ball and pick up things such as this. This is what these five little square um, things that are called rocks. They're not really rocks, you know. To toss one and pick up three and catch it on your fingers and toss it in the air and catch it backwards and go this way and that. You know, kick it through. I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of a lot of halachas. I don't follow them all. Uh, that's not my strong point. My wife, my wife would get down on the floor and play Chamei Shavanim with the kids. You know. I would say, yeah, it looks good. Look, looking good from here. <laughs> so, uh, so, okay. So I don't have to enjoy every activity. Yeah. Um, I have some of my children who are expert colors. I like to go for like a more of a broad stroke Picasso kind of approach, you know, color, you know, use of color, you know. But I have, I've got kids who sit there with the little pencils and fill in. I used to buy for Cholomoyed, I'd buy these, you know, paint by numbers, but sometimes you can get them with colored pencils. There's like a million of these tiny little things, different colors, and they're sitting there coloring and coloring. And uh, that's not really for me. I'm more of the like round circle with the stick and the two little arms and legs coming out of it, you know. And that's, that's you know. But uh, but they're all very excited when they sit down at the table and they all draw, and I can ooh and ah over it afterwards. So here's what I think is the aside. To be a good parent, you have to learn how to quell. If kids just annoy you, 
you're not going to be a very good parent. You have to quell. Now, that doesn't mean you have to engage in each activity. I don't have to do the paint by numbers, but I have to look at them and say, oh, that is so adorable. You, you got to find your kids cute. You got to find them fun, enjoyable. It doesn't mean I have to do everything that they do. Uh, uh, I don't get busy. I don't get it. it smells horrible. It, 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 you can't even chew it, you know. There are entire pieces of bisley still inside of people's stomachs that have never come out from the time they were kids. I mean, they, I don't think it's digestible. I don't know, you know, and kids walk around the and it stinks and it's horrible, you know. Okay, but just because I don't enjoy bisley doesn't mean that I can't, you know, quell when I watch my children or grandchildren with a bisley and they're so excited. Sometimes you have these kind of kids... You know, and then like they'll be eating Bisley and they'll sing the Bisley song, you know, whatever that means. Oh, I love Bisley, I have Bisley, and I'm eating Bisley all day, I'm eating Bisley. <laughs> now, I don't have to eat the Bisley to appreciate the pure joy on the face of these children who are eating the Bisley. That's great. Having a great time. They're having fun. And I'm felling from it. So although I do not have to participate, in every activity that they do, I do have to learn to enjoy my children. TG asks, if you had a yeshiva, which bachrim would you gear your yeshiva for? What would be different than existing yeshivas in the U.S. and Israel? What would the schedule look like and what would you focus on? Um... I have a nephew who's a rabbi, and um, and he has a congregation, um, small to medium sized congregation. And I said, you know, the rabbinate in America is a profession. You know, you move up to a bigger shul. <clears throat> he says, I feel like this is the right amount. If I had more than this, I wouldn't be. So, I don't think I could be successful. I wouldn't be able to connect with all the people. This is the right number. Yeah, and Malcolm Gladwell in the tipping point mentions there's a certain number where beyond that you it's just numbers. You can't really be on top of everybody and everything. Unless you're Shlomo Melech. Shlomo Melech had a thousand wives and he was able to have a um intimate relation with each one of them. But most of us are not Shlomo Melech to be able to to have those koiches. Yeah. I would want to take the type of a bacher who goes to the American program in the mirror. And I'd want to get a yeshiva of between 50 and 80 guys. Not more. And the purpose of the yeshiva would be to focus on growing in your learning and in your midas and hashkafas. It says in Pekiavos, uh, Omdim Talmidim Harbe, says the Tosfus Yantif. It means stand them on their feet. You have to build people. And when there was a Muslim movement and you had real Mashkichim, that was their job to look at a Bachar and figure out what is in the Kudu to help this person realize their potential. I would not want to be the Rosh Hashiva, I'd want to be the Mashkich. To spend my time working with guys, helping them reach their personal best. And I have some big time chacham that will help them grow in their learning. I, 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 can, I can, you know, share a certain mahalach in learning, but uh, okay, you want a famous Rosh Hashiva, fine. Sit there and, and steig. But I want people to grow as people. I want them to become bali midas and bali musa. And I want them to become uh, people who are... Um, uh, happy and fulfilled and have beautiful marriages and have beautiful parents. That's what I'm looking for. To build people who are going to be successful people in Yidin in the world. That's what I'm looking for. Anonymous asks, for someone who doesn't like Chalant very much, do you have any suggestions for something else to make for Shabbos? Okay. A full disclosure, that means basa shlamim. So even on Yantav, you don't have to have meat. 
Yeah. But um, but there's more of an Indian of having meat on Yantav than there is on Shabbos. Um, and that's why, traditionally, on Friday night, people have chicken and chicken soup, and they're not necessarily having a roast or, or having meat. Yeah. Um, I've reached an age where the foods that I can safely digest grow smaller and smaller with each passing year. So there's certain things that I, I, I love. Like American frankfurters on a roll, must and sauerkraut. But if I eat, eat them, I'm going to be sick. At least a day, maybe two. Um, falafel. I love falafel. And... Uh, and there's a place here in Yerushalayim, everyone knows if they ever anywhere in that neighborhood, they bring me back a falafel. I'll be sick for at least two days. But I really enjoy it. Cholent is one of those foods. When I go to a Shabbos lunch, and I sit down, and you have chopped liver, and you have cold cuts, and you have cholent, and you have kishka, I'm going to be sick for at least two days. I always do. And that's why uh, when I go to America, and that's the um, standard fare, I am sick. I'm sick all, mostly Shabbos, all, all Sunday. It's a terrible thing. I can't, I can't digest it. So, uh, so me, and I'm not saying anyone should learn from me, but me, um, I actually have milk eggs for Shabbos lunch. And um, uh, we make a, a pasta dish, we make fish, um, you know, bagels, you know, um, spreads, and a cup of coffee. And I don't even eat too much of that, because otherwise I'm sick the next day. So I'm not recommending that. I'm just saying that uh, a number of my kids are very thrilled when they come to us and we're having milk eggs for lunch, because a lot of people have the same experience. Um, when we serve the Fleischer meal, which we do sometimes, um, uh, I'm very often part of at the end. I'll have a piece of kugel, a piece of bread, and some dips. I, I just, I can't digest it. So let's say you want to make your um, uh, meal, but you don't like chilling. So a few suggestions, and assuming you don't want to go milking, which I understand. Uh, one is to make chicken cutlets. I'm being very meduyak here. I did not say schnitzels. Chicken cutlet is a piece of chicken breast that is breaded and egged and then fried on both sides until it's done. Yeah. Um, I grew up with this in America. It was, uh, it was um, a, a real treat. That's what we used to have. We'd have it with spaghetti and uh, chicken cutlets. By the way, now that I'm doing recipes again, I haven't done them in a while, uh, I have a I have a couple of things I, I must share with you. First of all, my wife changed my schnitzel making. For years, I've only done one thing, the way my mother did it. I dipped it in the egg, I dipped it in the matzo meal, and I fried it. And they come out very good. My children spiced the matzo meal. So I started doing that. A little salt, a little pepper, a little paprika, a little garlic, a little onion soup mix, mix it all up together. Okay, that was a positive change. And the other thing that my wife taught me is that first you bread it, then you egg it, then you bread it again. So I have been doing that. That's a, that's a, a, a new step forward for me. And uh, I've, been, uh, I've been doing that. Okay. But I told you, I, I get a kick out of reading the, um, the recipe sections in these Jewish publications. And I saw a couple of pieces of advice repeated a lot of times. And I figured, okay, I'll try it. One is a person complained, my food is bland. So they said, that's because you're supposed to salt it throughout the cooking. Salt it when you first fry the onion. Salt it when you do this. Try the onion. Yeah. Okay. I did that for my vegetable soup. Inedible. And by the way, when it's so salty, there's almost nothing you can do. So they say, well, take some raw potato. I made lots of raw potatoes. I make mashed potatoes afterwards with salted mashed potatoes. It didn't help because I salted the whole time. Yeah, don't listen to them. At the end, add a little salt and taste it. And if you want more, add a little more salt and taste it. Do not salt throughout. And I saw this tip in a couple of places too. They said, add a splash of vinegar. Oh, 
It'll bring all the taste alive. No, it'll make it taste sour, which is exactly what it did. So if you want a sweet and sour soup in a Chinese restaurant, then put in vinegar. Otherwise, don't put vinegar into your soups. This is the voice of experience. I actually listen to these people. Why? Stupid, stupid, stupid. There's nothing to be gained from it. Listen to me. Now you listen to me. Anyway, I haven't done some cooking tidbits in a while, so I'm going to throw some of those in as we move along. So uh, so what do you do? Okay, here to me is what I consider to be one of the dumbest ideas, is they make deli roll. What this is, they take all of the cold cuts, which make me sick to start with, and then they put it in phyllo dough, which um, I remember reading an article from the head of mine, Yeshua, he used to write in the, the Ted Joseph Liebman, and he said, there's probably nothing worse you can eat than barreca dough. It's like, you know, might as well just, might as well just stab yourself in the heart right now. It's, it's the worst thing you could possibly eat. It's the worst thing for you. So I take the cold cuts, which are hard to, and wrap it up in this stuff. Oh, that was the other t- tip I wanted to give you. I stumbled on this completely by accident. Um, I was making a chicken pot pie. I happen to like chicken pot pie. My mom used to make chicken pot pie. But in America, you can buy these pie shells. Here you get what's called batsake alim. Uh, I don't know if it's called phyllo dough. I don't know exactly what it's called, you know? Anyway, what do they do? They cut a piece of it, they put it in a pan, and they smush it down a little bit, and they put the filling in, yeah. But it comes out so thick, you can't even eat it. So I was rolling it out, yeah, rolling out a piece of dough to put in, and it started to split. So I pulled it back together in a ball, and I re-rolled it again, and it came out like dough, like actual dough. I put it in the pan and took another thing, made strips on the top. Uh, my daughter, who is a bit of a good nay, she was like, I was shocked. You made your own dough? I said, no, that's batsek alim. I just rolled it out as if it was dough, and it came out like dough. You know? So I rolled it out once, and I smooshed it up, and I rolled it out a second time, and I used it like regular pie dough. Amazing. Step forward. Anyway, so I stress... Uh, Chicken, uh, um, uh, what I'm calling, uh, you know, uh, chicken cutlets as opposed to a schnitzel. If you took that same chicken cutlet and you banged it with a hammer until it was four times its size, and then you soak it in oil long enough that you could put in a wick and recreate the Hanukkah miracle, you know, and you fry it to death, that's called a schnitzel. You heat that up on the Blech on Shabbos and it's inedible. It's barely edible beforehand, but I mean, chicken cutlet, you know, so you. You make them beforehand, you put it in a pan, you heat it up on the, on the, the nishlecht, pretty good. Um, another suggestion, chicken salad. You can make either regular chicken salad or uh, um, a, a grilled chicken salad, whatever it is, you add that in, it's very refreshing. Uh, me, um, I grew up, Shabbos lunch, we used to take the boiled chicken from the soup, take two pieces of challah or bread, ketchup and lettuce, make a sandwich. It's delicious. Uh, so there are there are options besides uh, chalant that you can definitely go for. My son, who is much more creative, he makes a whole shawarma meal. He puts out shawarma and fried onions and and uh, chips and he heats everything up and, you know, and puts out big pitas and, and everybody makes their own shawarma. Very exciting. So uh, so there definitely are options for you. Now, if you're looking for interesting Cholent uh, recipes and approaches, you can go back to episode 83, The Art of Making Cholent, which was the last one we did before Corona and uh, switched to the Zoom. All right. Um, Anonymous asks, it's been 2,000 years. Do you think Sinas Chinam will ever be eradicated bringing Mashiach? Will he come through alternate circumstances? That's a, that's a tough question. He can come through alternate circumstances. He can. But uh, the Gemara says that if we don't do tshuva in the end, the Kodesh Baruch Hu will bring a melech kosher kahaman to get us to do tshuva. Why? Because in the Purim story, there was a tremendous achdus. 
Because nothing brings people together like knowing we're all going to die tomorrow. You're dying tomorrow? Me too. You can go first. Yeah. It, it brings people together. As the American Revolutionary said, gentlemen, if we do not hang together, then we shall surely hang separately. So when you need each other, yeah, you, you, sin is something you can't afford. We're desperate. So if the situation gets so desperate that we have no choice but to rely on each other, we won't have time for sin is That's not something you can afford when you have to rely on some somebody else. When people go out to battle, they say, I have to know that the person next to me is somebody I can count on when the shooting starts, that we can depend on each other. So without something serious happening, do I see the Jewish people all of a sudden putting aside all of their pettiness? No, I'm not that optimistic. Do I hope that's what happens? Yes, I hope everyone puts aside, because the other consequences are going to be terrible. But a Kodesh Baruch Hu, when the time comes, will drag us into Yemos Mashiach kicking and screaming if we don't want to go any other way. Chamushim alu b'nei Yisrael Eretz Mitzrayim. One out of every five. And that's the best scenario. It could be one out of 50. It could be one out of five. It gets worse. So uh, it would be nice if we could put them all aside. And I realize there are people who, in spite of everything, hate their fellow Jew. And those people make me so angry I could just kill them. <laughs> <laughs> I stole that line from Tarn Lero, who was a professor of mathematics, and he wrote funny songs, which is always remembered for. But he said, that he goes, I realize there are people who do not love their fellow human beings, and I hate people like that. <laughs> anyway, halavai. Halavai, we should all come together. All right, my friends, that's it for this episode. If you want to find out more about the show, you can go to my website, rabbialowski.com. You, uh, you can send an email. You can make a comment. You can sponsor an episode. Uh, have it your way. Special orders don't upset us. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, that's it. Until next time. I am David Olowski, and this is The Rabbi Olowski Show. It's The Rabbi Olowski Show. Torah and Simcha, ready to go. The Rabbi Olowski Show. Knowledge and wisdom will help you grow. Lots of fun in every episode, and we don't have to rhyme. No, we don't. It's The Rabbi Olowski Show. On RabbiOrlovsky.com Torah Anytime YouTube and more It's Rabbi Orlovsky Show Torah and Simba Ready to go It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show Till next time Till we meet again It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show, it's the Rabbi Orlovsky show.